It's July 29th, 2018, and this is App Mostly Linux on Mostly Gaming. Today we're going to focus on Linux gamers' rights, we're going to take a look at React OS and the rest of the news, and we're going to ask a question. How many Steam games are playable on Linux anyway? Let's roll. And thanks for joining us for another episode of At Mostly Linux on Mostly Gaming, episode 0.18. We're moving up that numbering curve. Um, this week, our featured dis uh, distribution is Antergos. Uh, Gnome 18.7. We're back on Antergos this week. Uh, I tested a few other distributions for our weekly distro and they just didn't stick. I tried Debian, I tried Slackware, I haven't tried Gen 2, uh, but they, you know, I just had some problems with, with, you know, various little things that were annoying enough that I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to my base platform of Intergos and use that for our distribution this week. Yeah, so I mean, Intergos is what it is. We've talked about it before, so I won't get into it. Um, our featured uh, video this week is... ...bring him profit. They can play so many different heroes, like Monty mentioned during the pre-show. Gesture, whether he plays Orisa or Winston. Yes, that's our favorite sport. That's the Overwatch League. That was game one of the grand final. That's the championship for the Overwatch League, the first season uh, between uh, the Philadelphia Fusion and the London Spitfire, which uh, which both are surprise entries into the final. There was uh, it's a twelve team league. Six teams make it to the uh, playoffs. These guys were ranked number five and six. So big upsets on both sides. Uh, I would say most people are picking Philadelphia to win, but that doesn't change the fact that London took game one. And, uh, and and quite uh, you know quite firmly as well uh, the score was three to one. Uh, I have to say the the quality of the broadcast is incredible. Uh, Activision Blizzard is doing a tremendous job with uh, with the Overwatch League. Uh, it's it's very watchable. It is professional. It looks good on the screen, uh, as you can see up there on the uh, upper right. And uh, for the first time ever. An eSport was on ESPN, and uh, by the time you're listening to this, uh, it'll be the first time that uh, an eSport has been on a major broadcast network in the United States. Uh, the the final games, uh, the grand final, which uh, are going on uh, Saturday, July 28th, which is today for me, but for you guys in the future, that'll be tomorrow. So it'll already would have happened in terms of who the winner is. Uh, but that will be broadcast on ABC. I hope it goes to three games. Both teams have had a tremendous run in these playoffs, and I'd like to see it go uh, the full way. Uh, for those of you guys that uh, the play Overwatch, um, I you know I mean check it out. Uh, for those of you that don't, it's a free weekend, so you can uh, you can download the game and give it a shot and see what it's all about. Uh, just download and install the Blizzard Net or Battle Net. Fully playable on Linux, by the way. The uh, best way to do it is to run Lutris and install the uh, the Battle Net uh, installer. Or in Lutris, there's an Overwatch installer as well. So just search for Overwatch or Battle Net, install it, and give it a run. Plays very well under Linux. Um, very well indeed. All the uh, all the Blizzard games actually play very well on on uh, on Linux. Uh, the Activision games not as much. Um, Destiny Two is on the Battle.net app as well, but I I haven't tried that. But I I have not heard uh, anybody mentioning that as being compatible or working. So I I, I wouldn't hold out anything for that. But uh, Overwatch uh, does work and. That is the extent of our small talk today because we've got big talk to get to. So we're going to take a 10 second break and we'll be back right after this. Thanks for sticking with us. 
here on at mostly Linux on mostly gaming. Uh, the first one here that we're going to talk about is is React OS. React OS is uh, now up to uh, alpha version 0.4.9. And for those of you that are not familiar with React OS, it is a Windows clone. And these guys have been working on it for, believe it or not, for 20 years. That's when it first started. They're on version 0 0.4.9. Uh, that was released this week. And the purpose of the, uh, of the project is to create a Windows compatible alternative to Windows that's open source. And I won't say they've been making great progress because the progress has been okay given that it's 20 years of work. Uh, but you know what? They are they are coming together. Uh, they've added some, uh, some additional features to this latest version that you can see on the screen if you're watching the video. And uh, they've uh, improved the stability. Uh, they've added some shell improvements and features. And, um, and you know, they're, they're slowly improving the compatibility as well. The biggest issue for React OS uh, has been uh, drivers in terms of getting the drivers to work uh, and making uh, do with uh, with open source drivers. So for those of you that are on the PeerTube or the YouTube or the Twitch stream, uh, we have installed uh, we've installed it in a KVM, and I'm going to run it right now. And we'll take a look at it. So here is React OS in all of its uh, glory, as it were. It uh, it certainly has the look of uh windows xp more so than um you know vista or 8 or 10. uh the messaging down here at the bottom uh at the bottom right you can see this is based on nt 5.2 uh which is um which is an older version but you know still has quite a bit of compatibility now I have to admit this is not a very good looking distribution at this at this point. It is an alpha, as I mentioned before, but it is coming along. You know, it, it is running. Uh, you can see it here. It is it is not pretty. The background looks pixelated. I believe the reason for this, I'm running it actually at the uh, 1600 P. Uh, I believe I'm running it in a window here, uh, but the I believe it's using a, a, a standard VGA driver rather than an NVIDIA driver, which would improve, uh, which would improve it considerably if, if I could get the NVIDIA driver on. They do have an NVIDIA driver download, and I have installed it, but I, you know, I didn't fiddle around with it long enough to get it to work. Presumably, there is a way to get it to work, and if I got it to work, uh, perhaps this would look a little cleaner on the screen. I have been able to install a number of applications. So over here is uh, the latest version of uh, Firefox, which works. It's a little slow, but it is the latest version, and you can synchronize that up uh, with your with your Firefox account and be able to access everything that you can on the Linux or regular Windows version. You can see here. The you know the, the performance is slow, but but to be fair to React OS, I'm running this in a VM. I think I've allocated only a gigabyte of RAM. So um, so you know don't hold the you know the stuttering against it. Uh, you know try to run regular Windows in a one gigabyte computer and see what happens. Uh, there's a number of applications that are uh, whoa what is just happening there. Uh, React OS is going crazy. Um, the, the system has, unlike Windows, a package manager, though. And uh, I really, after whatever number of years of, of Windows, I, it, it just it always boggles my mind that they have not added a package manager other than the Windows Store, which doesn't even support uh, standard uh, Windows 32 packages. 
Uh, this does have a package manager. Uh, I can fix what's going on on my screen. I'll try to run it. Um, let's see if I can close Firefox. That seems to be driving my system crazy. Uh, it's it's not closing. Uh, well, let's just leave it there. You can see I've installed LibreOffice, and that seems to run reasonably well, though I'm getting a big kind of stuttering mess right here right now. We're back after a reboot. Uh, let's take a look at this. I think the issue there was I hadn't rebooted in a while, and there might have been some attrition in the memory, uh, in the memory management, considering that I've only allocated a gig. Uh, that was probably a mistake. I should have uh, given it four, maybe even eight. Uh, I, I went with the default setup on KVM, and that's what it assigned. Um, but let's take a look quickly at the Applications Manager. Uh, you can get a sense of the apps that are available on the system. Uh, it's actually it's it's a pretty good um, package manager. Um, you know, th there's a good selection of applications available right inside of 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 the app manager. I would probably not. Um, you know, I probably wouldn't try to just go out and and uh, and install random apps uh, but you know the ones that I've tested uh, that are in the package manager inside of react OS uh, seem to be working reasonably well um, you can see the you know the good old-fashioned start menu here you're not going to be able to you know to play steam games and that kind of thing there are a couple of uh, you know games that are included on here like you know the trusty old solitaire and so forth um you know but it's 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 coming along it's an interesting project that you know one of the one of the you know one of the risks of course is that something like windows is um is run by microsoft and as as odd as it may sound what if you know what if someday microsoft decides to uh, abandon Windows or or the older ver versions of Windows uh, as they're already doing and then those apps can't run from from the perspective of just maintaining older applications and files this is this is a worthy project uh, yeah, this would not be anybody's daily driver you know clearly <laughs> uh, it's it's not a terrific experience uh, but you know what it's an interesting thing that's react OS uh, you know, I wish the guys that are working on it uh, the best of luck, and we'll keep uh, we'll keep an eye on it uh, down the road. But speaking of new OSs, it looks like SteamOS version three is on the way. It's code uh, the code name is Clockwork. Uh, you can see here the article on the screen is from um, Gaming on Linux. Liam Daw uh, put it together. And he says here that uh, Valve are pushing ahead with some major updates to SteamOS with SteamOS 3. Looks like it would be code. It will be codenamed Clockwork, continuing the tradition of naming their versions after Dota 2 characters. Uh, Valve actually hinted that this was coming with the last update to SteamOS, where they noted that they had updated their build infrastructure. Liam says, I wouldn't expect major changes in how SteamOS actually operates though, as this will likely involve kernel and GPU driver updates to help SteamOS keep up with modern hardware. Uh, it does show that they still believe in it though. Uh, slow and steady wins the race. Will be fun to see exactly what it includes. Um, I have been a big fan of SteamOS. Uh, I have used it. I bought one of the original uh, uh, Alienware Steam Machines version one. Uh, version two uh, was a significant improvement to version one. Uh, recently, they added some additional uh, uh, driver updates. Um, SteamOS is a worthy project. I, many people, many Linux enthusiasts like ourselves, basically, you know, look at it and say, "What is the point? <laughs> Why don't I just run?" you know ubuntu or or arch or whatever the distribution that you have and i can basically run all of that stuff anyway it's just a steam os client um and i can do everything else that i want and i can set it up on a tv if i want yes you can do everything that you can do on steam os on a full desktop operating system uh system including linux but i would just say this to the to the uh, linux aficionados out there 
people that use Windows can make the same argument vis-a-vis -vis Linux that you can make that Linux users can make vis-a-vis -vis SteamOS. Everything you can do on Linux, gaming-wise in particular, you can do on Windows and probably better. So why use Linux? And and the reason to use Linux, and I, I mean everybody that uses Linux knows the reasons, but there are important reasons with respect to usability, speed, uh, privacy, and and the experience, uh, which I believe is more conducive to productivity as well uh, than under Windows, and, and that's why we use Windows. Uh, and the same applies for SteamOS. SteamOS is a specific use case, which is a console experience on your television, and so it is designed in that way. I have, I still have my Steam machine hooked up uh, to one of the TVs in the house. There is a great deal of value to turning it on, having the Steam client come in, having little to no interaction from, from me, not having to worry about drivers or anything, right? And SteamOS is also very important as a base platform for developers to build to. And rather than basically saying to developers from Valve's perspective, you know, support any one of a number of distributions, Typically, they, they, they target Ubuntu. If you target SteamOS, then that is what we will be pushing on our platform. If it works for SteamOS, then you can be assured that it will be on Steam and that you can focus your support on that uh, or on Ubuntu, which is what most uh, developers do. Um, so, I, you know, like I said, I use it. I like it. Uh, the other value of SteamOS in my in my experience is the game's work. Every game that I've ever run has worked. I've never had a problem with a game. Uh, I'm sure that there's some exceptions out there, but a you know a a platform that you turn on and you use and you game and you turn off is ideal. And there's nothing else that can do that right now on the PC. Windows can't do that. That is a disaster. For, for 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 a console like gaming experience uh, but Microsoft is pushing Xbox for that and Linux of course I mean you know Linux is is an operating system and an operating system is not a console like experience so uh, I am very uh, enthused by the fact that Steam OS continues to operate I'm often in the Steam OS reddit as well helping people that are that are looking uh, to try it and giving advice and and so forth um, I, I believe gaming on Linux when they started up they were focusing quite a bit on Steam OS as well so uh, we are fans and uh, it's it's terrific that it's continuing to move forward um, so we've got you know the react OS stuff on the one hand then we've got you know the Steam OS stuff on the other hand and I guess the third story on our news feed this week will be some news that came out of Microsoft uh, leaked actually out of out of one of the you know the Microsoft friendly sites uh, that Microsoft's next generation Xbox will focus on what they refer to as X Cloud game streaming and that an X Cloud service is on the way. And reading here from The Verge. Uh, they say that Microsoft is currently developing its next generation Xbox with recent reports suggesting the console will launch in 2020. Uh, reports are that Microsoft is also working on a second Xbox console that would be limited to streaming games. The streaming only console will reportedly include a low amount of local compute for handling tasks like controller input. These tasks are essential to reducing latency in game. Uh, in game streaming and Microsoft is said to be planning to slice up processing between the game running locally and in the cloud in order to reduce input lag and other image processing delays. So, you know, this is interesting because we've been hearing about more and more game streaming rather than running the games local for, for some time now. And we've, we've talked about it here on this podcast, uh, you know, we're on episode 18. I'm sure we've talked about it in probably a third of these episodes. It appears to be happening. I've been skeptical at first. 
but we have seen more and more of it coming together and the performance uh, appears to be improving over time as well to the point where by 2020 it may very well be viable and what microsoft is doing here is interesting in the sense that they are not doing you know a steam link type uh, type of an approach they're actually going to embed some hardware uh, with enough juice in the box itself to offload uh, a bunch you know a bunch of the 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 local processing to the local machine and to probably just uh, offload, um, you know, key streaming components to the cloud. Microsoft runs the Azure cloud, uh, so they have uh, obviously the expertise. But interestingly enough, Xbox does not use Azure, uh, which is you know kind of strange, right? I mean, you've got this this massive cloud infrastructure, but you're not using it on some of your own key uh, applications. I believe Skype isn't using it either. So, so maybe they're going to transition um, the next Xbox to Azure, and then uh, and then they're going to splice up the code. Maybe they're going to splice it up in in uh, arrays so that you know whatever code gets to you faster, they can send like multiple streams. The one that gets to you faster is the one that will be executed on the local machine. Um, in general. First of all, I have no doubt that Microsoft's going to keep this proprietary, right? They want to sell you games on their system. So being able, while your computer on Linux or on Windows or what have you, can likely do this as well as uh, whatever set-top box they want to sell to you, I doubt that they will open up the uh the box uh, or the software and make it run on a Linux machine. They have, though, made some statements that they want to see this running on multiple devices. And I, I, I don't see why. I mean, why not have it uh, running on a Linux desktop? Uh, you still will be required to buy the games from the Microsoft Store. So that would be the key to them because they get a cut of, out of everything that's sold there. So, so why not would be my question. And I guess we will see, but if we can get more streaming out there, including projects by NVIDIA, projects by PlayStation, uh, uh, projects by Valve, of course, and uh, Electronic Arts maybe doing something along those uh, lines as well, then if we can get these clients to work on Linux, it really solves one of the big barriers to people uh, coming over to Linux, which is access to AAA gaming. And while that is being addressed, I think, through Wine and DXVK and other Linux-based projects, you know, look, being able to basically run a client and playing whatever game you want is, is the nirvana uh, for, for Linux gaming and streaming maybe, maybe, uh, a path in that direction. So we'll continue to follow uh, stories on streaming as uh, as they develop, uh, because I, you know, again, I, I think it can be positive for Linux gaming. And that's our news feed this week. We'll be back in ten seconds with our tweets. <music> We're back. Thanks for sticking with us here as we take a look at what we've been tweeting this past week. And there's been there's been a number of interesting stories out there that we've kind of gone back and forth with people on. Um, let me start off with actually a pretty good news story here. And this is uh, a story that appeared in nag.co, nag.co.za. I wonder if that is that New Zealand. I'm not sure what a .za uh, uh, goes to, but Nag Online is looks like somebody's blog. Uh, the article was written by one Wesley Cataclysma Fick. So Wesley Fick uh, on uh, this is, goes back to June 28th, and uh, and and Wesley writes here about his experience with respect to DXVK and finally getting off the Windows 10 train. 
And uh, Wesley writes here that uh, he's tried running Manjaro once, but there were issues with my USB 3 ports, uh, the motherboard, and when he tried it in the past, uh, he, you know, he moved to Ubuntu. He tried a whole bunch of different things on his netbook, on his laptop, on his desktop. And he's always found in the past that he's had problems getting his games to work on Linux, at least satisfactory enough that he would stick there. And so then he says that the impetus for this recent change where he tried it again, uh, is surprisingly, uh, Windows 10 itself. In other words, he's basically saying Windows 10 has finally driven him to come back and give Linux another try. He says the latest upgrade to version 1803 has been a dumpster fire for many, and it's only getting worse for anyone who hasn't installed it on their machines yet. First, the upgrade wouldn't complete on computers running Avasti antivirus. Then there were the BSODs and corrupt partitions on Intel and Toshiba solid state drives. There was freezing issues with Chrome and Edge when running GPU accelerated workloads in the browser and the black screen blanking and shader cache, uh, cache issues with the latest NVIDIA drivers. Then people started seeing broken installs, DPC latency spikes that would desync audio, various keys not working, heck, even Internet Explorer 11 is missing, and that was intentional. Ladies and gentlemen, that is that is all the reason you have to move over to Linux if you're kind of thinking of doing it. Uh, and I hear more and more of these stories about just people having horrific experiences with Windows and then coming over to give Linux a try. And so, and so Wesley basically had enough of that and he decides to basically give Linux another shot. Thoughts a little bit here about, uh, uh, you know, the transition to Vulkan and OpenGL and 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 you know some background on 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 the compatibility uh, the compatibility uh, layers uh and then he uh, dives in through wine and a program called lutris which we have been saying since forever that you know wine dxvk and lutris are critical components of transitioning Windows users over to Linux. It's it's kind of like the bait. Look, you can play many more of your games than you think. Give it a try. And when you basically have a decent enough experience, you'll stick, which is exactly what happened uh, here. So uh, Wesley talks about, you know, how easy it was to install Lutris. Um, you know how it manages wine how it's uh, simple to basically install games with you play bethesda ea uh, origin and so forth uh, and then he basically says that suddenly large numbers of games are playable with much higher performance than traditional wine prefixes would allow overwatch the witcher 3 far cry 4 crisis 3 arma 3 and uh, many others are playable with dxvk uh, prefixes uh, just a week ago, the release of Wine 3.9 in the stage and came with the announcement uh, that, you know, they were implementing BKD3D, a project driven by the Wine team to integrate a DirectX 12 to Vulkan Translator, which is true, that's coming, and, you know, that would be effectively the rest of the Windows games are now playable. Um, Wesley says, uh, the tipping point has come and gone, and it's finally time for me to move. I kept on using Windows because the alternatives weren't yet in a place that it would be a good idea for me to switch. I kept an eye on how many games were Linux compatible in my Steam library, and I don't buy new ones that weren't. I was biding time, and the only thing that I'd really keep Windows around for is the excellent and beautiful Morza Motorsport 7. For everything else, the Wine Project and DXVK has matured to the point where I don't have to stay. One third of my library natively runs in Linux and the other two thirds across Steam, Uplay and Origin will all become compatible in time. Even Forza 7 will when they become playable on Linux because there's a movement to port over the Windows runtime environment into Wine. And he basically says in the rest of his article here, goodbye to Windows and hello to, uh, to Linux. And uh, Wesley, we are happy to have you. Welcome aboard. Uh, grab yourself some popcorn and listen to our podcast. There's many other podcasts you can listen to. 
you know, it's a huge uh, community out here for you to basically join. And once you're here, you're one of us, and uh, it's hard to go back. That's Wesley Fick, uh, which, which you know, then leads to the question of how many Linux games, how many, how many Steam games are playable on Linux now anyway? And we got into a bit of a back and forth with, uh, with this guy that runs uh, TuxDB. You can see TuxDB's uh, website over here. Um, you know, it's basically a hub for Twitch streams and, and, and news on Linux. And uh, this gentleman positions himself as a bit of, a, of an aggregator expert on, on Linux gaming, I guess, you know, app compatibility and so forth. And so in a previous episode, we we took a look at the best-selling games on uh, on Steam uh, for 2018. Let me see if I can get it on screen here. Best-selling Steam games 2018, which were released a while ago, and in one of our uh, in one of our episodes, I don't remember which one off the top of my mind right now we basically showed this uh this list which is a list of the top sellers uh for 2018 on steam and there's a list of of platinum and gold and silver and bronze uh there's roughly looks like 16 games in the silver category and then 12 in each of platinum and gold and so what we've done is we've taken a look at these games and we basically said, uh, look, you know, in terms of the Platinum games, you know, Warframe runs, Counter-Strike runs, Vermintide runs, uh, you know, granted the Windows games are running through, uh, you know, Wine or DXVK or both, but they run. Um, which one is this one? This is Grand Theft Auto V runs. Kingdom Come Deliverance, it runs. And so you go through these, and the only ones that I know for sure do not run, actually, the ones I know for sure run are basically everything here, uh, except for Far Cry 5, which I have not tested, so let's kind of put that there as not running. I know that Assassin's Creed Origin doesn't run, so let's assume that's a Ubisoft game, that's the same thing. Rainbow Six Siege also does not run. And... Uh, PUBG doesn't run. So that's three games, which means that nine of these 12 work under Linux, either natively or through something like Lutris, DXVK, Wine, Play On, whatever you have. Uh, that's 75%. Uh, no, but sorry. Nine out of 12 is 75%. Got to get my numbers right there as well. When you look at the gold numbers, I think I came up with a number of 67%. You know, the sil silver numbers are closer to about 70%. And then bronze is even higher because as you get to the indie-friendly games, uh, more and more of them are actually native on Linux or just work. So when we took a look at these numbers, yeah, granted, it's anecdotal. I'll give you that. But these are the most popular games on Steam. And I'm going to guess, I bet you 90% of all of the hours played on Steam are these lists right here. So, you know, our my view, again, anecdotal, is that, look, somewhere between, if you are a typical gamer that plays typical games, roughly one-third of your games are going to be native. Let's say 25% to one-third. And uh, that's my experience, and that's the experience of Wesley's, and that's the experience of most people that are out there. You take a look at your typical library, and you know depending on who you are the typical user is going to be probably between a quarter and a third of their library and then with dxvk particularly with dxvk it looks like anywhere between you know another third to maybe a half of the rest of the games will be playable and I, i'm going to say that that is conservative because my experience and i've played a lot of games you can see by my uh, Lutris uh, library here, uh, you know, I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of games. And out of every 10 that I try, I'm gonna say maybe two or three, you know, just do not work at all. And, you know, some might require some tweaking, uh, 
uh, on uh, on on um, uh, Lutris in particular or or somewhere else. But you know, if you take a look at my games right here, right now, and I you know I don't have a huge install, you know everything here works, and many of them are Windows only games, and pretty well everything that I want to play is working right now. Um, I would have very little issue in terms of saying, you know, typical user is going to have anywhere between two thirds and 70%, let's say 60 to 70% of their library will be Linux playable. And, and so this guy TuxDB basically took extreme aggressive offense to that statement. Uh, you know, and I guess there was no reason I, you know, I, I wasn't being rude back. I wasn't being mean back. I wasn't basically calling him names or anything. Uh, but he, I mean, the, the guy had, uh, you know, he was, he was pretty aggressive and basically saying that's nonsense. That, you know, if you take a look at the facts, which as he saw it, are his database, at TuxDB plus WineDB uh, plus, uh, you know, uh, other sources like that that you know the the list is quite a bit smaller and i don't dispute that i don't dispute that those databases uh do not show uh the the numbers that i'm talking about but i can tell you that those databases are old and they're not updated and they're not accurate and i'm not sure that relying on bad data is better than relying on the anecdotes that I provided. Because if you go to Reddit, there was a thread there that talked about uh, people and their experience with uh, Linux gaming. And they, their experiences were similar to mine. And I can tell you, you know, right up here in terms of, for example, games like uh, Dark Souls Remastered, um, that does not have a Lutris installer. That is not listed, you know, uh, in terms of of you know the, the the databases out there as far as I can tell and yet there it is and it's running and and there's a lot of other games that are just not updated so so you take a look at the data and it's not going to show the extent of the compatibility uh, of the games because at this point at this stage of DXVK in conjunction with wine and other similar projects most games are playable at, at good frame rates not not just kind of acceptable frame rates good frame rates fully playable under linux and there's been a, a number of articles on forbes about uh, this one reporter's transition over you know and i hope that uh, and i know that guy is going to be talking to the tuxdb guy i hope that we do not get a skewed view of linux gaming i, I did forward uh the reporter over to liam da uh, who I think is a, is a better representative of the community than either myself, frankly, or, uh, or this TuxDB guy. Uh, you know, Liam, uh, you know, sometimes uh, drinks the juice in terms of really, really pushing uh, Linux native gaming. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's fine. I have no issue with that uh, or with Liam. Um, but we take a slightly different view uh, that uh, gaming on Linux uh, should be uh, you know accessible to whoever wants to use it using whatever they do uh, they, they want to kind of use and 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 our, our view and I think others agree uh, to a large part is that look having a terrific experience on Linux is 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 much more important to encouraging a greater number of Linux users that will then increase the user base and, and provide you know further native Linux games uh, rather than the very small community that we have uh, rallying around and 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 shaming people into not buying any Windows games or running Wine, so that we could help developers increase their revenues in Linux. Um, and I, I, again, my view has always been, and I've discussed it in the past, that even if every Linux uh, gamer bought all of their games uh native linux games it probably would make a marginal difference to their numbers anyway uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our focus on topic which is linux gamers rights uh so anyway i, I mean I, I think it it's it's an interesting ongoing discussion in terms of wine and linux and lutric uh lutris and 
and and running VMs and dual booting and all of that kind of thing that I, I think is not going to go away. But you know, respectful dialogue is is the key for us. Uh, you know, in the Linux community, look, look, we find this in a lot of different you know uh, niche. Uh, markets where you know the the small numbers of believers the long tail people that uh, can find themselves and each other uh, in communities on on um, the internet uh, much better now than they could have let's say 20 or 30 years ago uh, are you know tend to get into kind of dogmatic wars of purity <laughs> right and and rather than focusing on on the many 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 things that they have in common they focus on the small number of things that they disagree about which which is not productive uh now one of the things that maybe many of us won't uh you know disagree with is the nintendo uh switch which is really an excellent uh platform uh, i've I, you know i got one of my own on uh, on launch day and one of the oh we're getting some sound there okay one of the one of the main issues that i have with it is you know on the positive it is a terrific platform for uh for handheld gaming it, it's not as good for you know a big screen experience but it is just such a wonderfully designed handheld uh and and a worthy successor to the uh, 3DS and, and, and the DS and, and the Game Boy Advance before that. Uh, very, very well designed, very smart uh, by Nintendo's, uh, on Nintendo's part uh, to, to, to find this opening and really drive people through. Um, now, one of the complaints that I have is that, you know games that would sell for 30 or 40 bucks everywhere else are selling for 60 dollars us on the on the switch store or the nintendo store and you know i recently uh it's, you know uh, installed bought purchased uh an rpg called octopath traveler which is you know very much a you know an old style kind of 16 bit uh type um rpg certainly inspired and i've got a picture here on the screen by you know those old school final fantasy type games and and you know if you can see the picture if you're on the video uh you know we've seen games like this on on steam we've seen games like this on pc uh, and they're selling for like 20 bucks. And this game in Canada, it's $80. With taxes, I paid over $90 Canadian for this game, uh, it, which is crazy. I mean, every time I want to buy a game on the Switch, I take a look at it and I and I, I, I either, you know, kind of pinch myself so that I don't scream out of pain at the price and scream out, you know, out of pain for something else, or I just don't buy it. I, I think I, I may have five games on the Nintendo Switch. The pricing is outrageous uh, because it is a proprietary system. Uh, and, and you know, they have a good number of games like this which are exclusive to the system. So if you want to play it, you know, tough luck, come up with the cash. But one of the benefits that they've been having uh, is that many of our, um, many of the publishers that uh, support Linux as well, usually because they, they, their games are, are developed on Unity, which, which has uh, native Linux support, are rushing over to the Switch uh, and developing and, 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 and releasing their games over there, often at a pretty significant premium to what uh, you know, the prices that they're available on Steam or GOG or what have you, uh, and selling quite well, certainly outselling whatever they're doing on Linux. Um, and this is, you know, this, it could be, it could be troubling um, if, if, if they are, you know, focusing on the larger volume of dollar sales on Switch rather than on, you know, either Steam, frankly, PC Steam uh, or Linux Steam. Uh, on the other hand, though, it could be a good thing uh, because many of these games are Unity. 
if you can basically develop more games on Unity and then port them over to uh, to the Switch, maybe the port over to Linux is also uh, in the works because it's it's an easy port. Octopath Traveler, and I'll, I'll double check, but I'm pretty sure that runs on the Unreal Engine, which also has Linux support. Uh, but is not as it's not as easy to translate uh, projects from Unreal to Linux as as easy at least as it is from Unity and and even recently I've been reading some some stories that concern me about recent developments in Unity that make it more difficult to support Linux and I, again that that's one of the issues with respect to our uh, focus on topic this week um, but you know my my tweet here is, you know, I, I mean, I bought it and it's on my playlist, but ninety dollars for a game, uh, for a game like this, I, I'm not sure whether I should be impressed or disgusted with, uh, with Nintendo, uh, you know, on that front, and I, I think I'm firmly. Uh, somewhere in between both kind of awe and disgust in, in part because because while I'm disgusted I should be disgusted at myself for, for, for you know putting up the money but the fact that I put up the money impresses me um, so that's uh, Octopath Traveler we'll come back in uh, 10 seconds with the discovery queue <laughs> And we're back with the Discovery Queue. Let's see what's new for Linux gaming. Uh, this week I did a search on GOG as well, and there was no new games released on uh, the Linux platform via GOG. So let's kind of take a look here and see what the Discovery Queue on uh, the... Um, on Steam is telling us basically here I'm just going they they have a, uh, a feature here where you can basically uh, take a look at what's new in your discovery queue and they basically have a list of 10 games that are um, programmatically determined to be of interest to you and new I'm not really sure how their algorithm works uh, but the first game in our list is something called Jolly Battle it's a two dollar game two dollars Canadian it's 40 percent off right now it looks uh you know it looks like a phone game um so let's take a pass on that um next game here is something called uh space hamster in turmoil this is 20 percent off it's four and a half dollars on uh on steam canadian uh, let's just take a quick look just because it looks so crazy here on uh, All right, not much to hear there, so let's just kind of mute the sound. Uh, Space Hamster in Turmoil is a shoot 'em up featuring a customizable ship. Uh, optional and unorthodox mechanics, seven interesting bosses, and a short story uh, that takes place one year after the extinction of our species. Space Hamster in Turmoil uh, that launched July 24th, available for Linux. The next game is Have You Seen My Robot, which looks like might be an M-rated game because it's asking me for my age here. Uh, in this six-hour comedy special, okay, this is a video. I really hate the fact that they show me videos in my Discovery Queue. Uh, Sword Art Online is another video. So that's of the four so far, they're one for four of having any interest for me in their uh, algorithm. Here's an actual game. It's Werewolves. Haven Rising. Uh, that's another four bucks. It's thirty-four percent off. Uh, launched a few days ago. Rise up, werewolves! Throw off the shackles of a tyrannical military police state. Fight for your pack. Fight for your honor. Fight for your 
freedom. Uh, taking a look to see if there's a video here. Is it a text based adventure? RPG adventure. Uh, play as male, female, or non binary, gay, straight, or bisexual. Very inclusive game. Uh, <laughs> uh, minimal. I mean, I, 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 you know what? I'm just taking a look at the screen here. It looks like it's uh, a choose your own adventure game. Um, so, text based choose your own adventure game. Next game on our list here is Don't Bite Me Bro. Don't Bite Me Bro. Don't Bite Me Bro has is a one to four player couch co-op open world zombie apocalypse game. Explore the world for resources, find and save survivors, blah, blah, blah. It's a buck. Pass. Chromasia Rock Paper Tactics is the next game on the list. This is an actual kind of $17 game uh, released uh, July 11th. Simplified combat that maintains depth for our beloved veterans. Unique rock, paper, scissors mini game that adds more excitement every battle. Choose your own path with eight different endings. Let's take a quick look here at the, uh, at the, at the trailer. All right, let's do it again. Nexus game. So enough. All right, so I'm going to pass on that one. So, so far, not a very good record here for your algorithms, Valve. Uh, Hero U Rogue to Redemption. This released July the 10th. Hero U Rogue to Redemption is a role playing adventure game by Laurie and Corey Cole, creators of the acclaimed Quest for Glory series. Players take on the role of Sean O'Connor at Hero University. Sean will make friends, explore, the haunted castle and use his rogue skills for fun and profit that's a 40 dollars game so maybe we're gonna give you guys a chance to show us your <laughs> your actual trailer here if you think it's worth 40 bucks take a look Okay, I think we get the drift there. Uh, isometric, top-down, you know, RPG. I, geez, you know, for 40 bucks, though. I mean, I, is this going to be competitive with something like uh, Pillars of Eternity 2? I don't know. I mean, the reviews here are positive, all reviews. It's got about 47 reviews. Uh, transistor games I gosh guys you know what I'm a guy that just paid 90 bucks for a game on my switch but I don't know I, I, I I'm not you know I, I wouldn't pay 40 bucks for this right now 
Uh, it's not on sale or anything. I, I'm going to add it to my wish list and we'll take a look uh, again. If it's at a significant discount, we'll take another look. Uh, and maybe that is the value of the Switch, right? You've only got so many games. You want to play something there. The game is 90 bucks. What alternative do you have? In any case, last game on our list is called Bernie's Nightmare. Uh, this came out July 28th, which is today. And it's an interactive horror journey inside a person's nightmare. This game is two bucks. So uh, I'm not going to give it too much time, but it is by a person or a gentleman or a company called Kevin Yang uh, Games. And uh, that we have a couple of more. We've got two more here. Kill skills. Uh, kill skills. Sure pass on it uh okay so the, both of the last two games were were kind of uh not looking that impressive anyway so anyway that's the discovery queue it doesn't look like there is a lot of stuff out there this week again like i said there was nothing on gog uh a few interesting things here on steam uh in terms of my gameplay like i mentioned earlier i played a little bit of pillar of um of uh, octopath traveler on my switch really want to get back to pillars of eternity 2 and Final Fantasy 12, maybe pick up a little bit of the Dark Souls Remastered, and you know, but I'm I'm kind of a little short on time. The other, I mean, I would love, you know, I also uh, spent a little time with Warhammer 40,000 Gladius Relics of War. Not enough to really have much of a judgment. It, it, it reminds me of kind of a combination between, you know, a real-time strategy game, your typical game out there, and something like, let's say, Civilization. A, a little more like Civilization than I expected it to be. Uh, but I liked it based on my first kind of crack at it. Certainly a worthy addition. Um, but man, there's a lot of Warhammer games out there uh, these days, isn't there? Uh, anyway, that's our discovery queue. We'll be back here in a couple of seconds with our focus on topic this week, which is Linux gamers' rights. <laughs> And we're back with our focus on topic this week, which is Linux gamers' rights. I'm going to begin here by reading an article from uh, Gaming on Linux again. This was published by Liam Dodge, July 27, 2018, uh, www.gamingonlinux.com. I support Liam's Patreon. You should, too, go over there, find them, support them, give them some money. He's doing a great job for the Linux community. But So I'm just going to read his article here, and with apologies to uh, Liam for, uh, for using his content. Uh, on the podcast, but I'm sure that anybody that wants to basically take a closer look will go to your website. And so here's his article. The uh, headline is Face Punch are no longer selling the Linux version of the survival game Rust. Sad news Face Punch are no longer selling the Linux version of their survival game Rust after removing mentions of Linux support yesterday from their Steam page. I'm just reading here from the website for those on the audio. Linux support has been available in Rust since 2013, along with continued support during early access and after the official release earlier this year. It was a bit of a surprise that we got an email from a reader to mention that in the Steam store page for Rust, uh, in the Steam store page for Rust was no longer showing the Steam OS Linux icon or listing it in the system requirements. Thinking it was a mistake, since nothing was announced, I, being Liam Da, reached a face punch to which they replied with, Hey dude, yeah, we stopped selling Rust for Linux. I did request more information as to why and will update this article if I receive any further information. To be fair, they haven't had a lot of time to respond again yet, but I feel it's important to get the word out. And then he kind of, you know, does some speculation here before he heard back from them and he gets an update from uh, Gary, which uh, responded on Twitter and said this. This is from uh, Gary, whatever his name is, the guy from Rust. And Gary's mod, I guess. 
Uh, we stopped selling Rust on Linux because we don't, we won't, don't give it to the Q. We let me start again. We stopped selling Rust on Linux because we won't, don't give it the QA support it needs. There are situations where there's a Unity Linux bug that pops up and we ship with it because it's the right decision for 99.99% of our players. And while 60% of Linux users are fine with this, they understand their position in this world, it's probably not the right thing to act like it's fine. So while we're still going to ship Linux updates and keep it up to date, we're not going to sell it anymore. Also Linux community. Being abusive, demanding, rude to the few developers actually shipping games to your favorite OS isn't the way to go. It makes me regret ever shipping Linux versions. And, and Linux then goes on to say, uh, I've said it before and I will say it again, developers are human. People do need to understand that and not to resort to throwing insults around right away. Even so, if you sell a game on any platform, you should be doing QA on it. There's no excuse for not doing it. And then there's a second update here that basically says, from another developer on Reddit, this is a, a different developer who, who commented on this point and said, Linux is and will still be supported, but the decision to remove Linux from purchase was mainly based on multiple issues in the current Unity version. We're currently unable to downgrade to a Unity version which corrects these Linux issues, and we're unable to upgrade Unity to 2018.2 due to a number of new issues. Linux is in a state of limbo in which we're unable to resolve. Instead of selling a broken platform, we decided to remove it from purchase but still offer it to existing players. Once Linux is in a working state, we'll review the decision. So that's that's the impetus for this uh, for this story. And I can tell you that. I'm of mixed feelings of it, you know, similar to, to many of you guys out there. But the question here is really this attitude by this guy, Gary, right? Uh, you know, he, he, he basically, you know, blames, uh, first of all, the 40% of the community, which is an outrageously large number and that I do not believe for a second represents the real number. And, and then he basically says that, you know, being, a, let me just kind of repeat this quote. Linux community, being abusive, demanding, rude to the few developers actually shipping games to your favorite OS isn't the way to go. It makes me regret ever shipping Linux versions. And I, my gut reaction to that is, is you know, the hell with you and your ilk. You know, we do not need to suck up to every every developer in the world that basically favors us he he the point here is that somehow you know the market is broken and he is doing us a favor by shipping a game on linux and that we should just basically accept their crappy broken ass non qa games um you know and 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 thank him and say more master more master thank you master which is outrageous, outrageous for any business person uh, to ever take a position like that with even the smallest number of their users, even the one user okay, that complains should get better treatment than what this prick uh, shouted out to us. Uh, which leads to the question then, um, you know, Liam's view is 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 one approach, and and you know he's 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 kind of hedging his bets a little bit here as well by basically saying, you know, that developers are human and we need to be nicer to them and and that kind of a thing. And actually, when when Liam and I first interacted, it was over not this particular issue, but a similar issue where somebody on Steam complain to a developer about a broken Linux version, respectfully in that particular case, um, and then was attacked by the developer in a manner similar to what Gary is doing here. And Liam posted there something generally that I took to be supportive of the developer over the user. And so then I attacked uh, Liam, and then we kind of got a little nasty there for a while. Um, but you know, the the view is okay. So 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 certainly there's very many shades of gray here, right? Between being a complete and utter and utter a hole, 
which nobody would 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 defend except for maybe the complete and utter a-hole themselves but to say that that's 40 percent of the community i think is outrageous I, I would say whatever the number is in linux is probably greater in windows you know ship a, a, a crappy ass broken game on windows via steam and see what happens there my friends okay we do tend to take a little more abuse than your windows counterparts do for the very reason that we have less choice in terms of gaming and so we tend to want to be happy with what we get but at what point is it valid to say to somebody this is crap and I, I paid my money and I deserve the support that I paid for or a refund. And, and by saying that, are we hurting Linux gaming? What rights do we have as Linux gamers? And I'll tell you my view and it's my view for what it's worth, okay? If you sell a game on Linux, it has to work, period, okay? And if we complain because your Linux game does not work, then you should fix it <laughs> or give us our money back and just like any other customer that buys any product we should be demanding what was promised and 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 really nothing more if 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 they promise you know a cracker and they give you a cracker then that is what you should be getting and not asking for more but if they promise you a slice of bread and they give you a cracker you should have you know the right to basically go back and say look you promised me a slice of bread and you gave me a cracker and i want my bread that i paid for if that is not being abusive to a developer that is not being rude and that is not being wrong that is being an advocate for yourself for your you know having the developer respect you as a customer and your money no matter what platform you're on and to the extent that there is a large number of Linux users that will only buy Linux native games, you know, forcing them to have the worst possible experience because, you know, they need to suck up for getting broken games because those are the only games that they will play is, is, is again, is abusive. And, and I would rather, for one, have a developer not release any game rather than a broken ass piece of crap that doesn't work that I've spent my money on. Okay, because if they don't ship the, the game, at least I've got my money. But if they do ship the broken ass game, then I don't have my money and I really don't have the game because it doesn't work. So I'm no better off. Uh, and and that's not a very good transaction for either party. Okay, because you've sold me something that doesn't work and have my money and I don't have my money to play something to reward a developer that does support a game that does work. So we've hurt the Linux community by encouraging developers to sell us broken crap uh, that, and, and then not standing up for our rights. Now, I, I don't think Liam or anybody else is basically saying not, you know, we shouldn't stand up for our rights. And, and certainly Liam is not saying that in his, in, his, uh, in his post here. But, you know, there is a line between respectful and, and, and demanding and, and being a complete prick and that can be a wide gap being demanding is not being a prick okay being demanding to the extent that you are asking for what you were promised is correct and we linux gamers should support that now going beyond that and getting abusive threats you know that nobody supports that and and nobody is even saying that this happened in this situation this developer is being abusive and we should admonish him for it. Now, somebody else did come back up with that second post that I mentioned, which, which was the real reason that they stopped supporting it and selling it, which apparently is because of a switch in Unity that, that creates compatibility issues. And that is a big deal for us Linux gamers, but it has nothing to do with, with whatever this Gary dude was talking about, okay? He went out of his way to create this narrative about about abusiveness right for people standing up for what they paid for and 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 i for one will never buy anything whether it's on windows or linux for this guy again okay i buy games on every platform and many of us i think what he is 
uh, ignoring here is many of us are not dogmatic Linux users. We buy games across a wide number of platforms, including Windows and consoles and switches and everything else. Okay, and and you may think we're a small market over here in the Linux community and you can attack us and, and that we're going to basically ask you to just, you know, more master kind of thing. But that's not the case, my friend. Okay, you're going to piss us off for being abusive to us and to our fellow Linux community members and we will not buy your games. We will not buy your games on any platform and we will basically help to have other people feel the same way because if you treat us this way, chances are you treat other people this way as well okay this is no different than somebody that bullies people that are in a weak position and bullies require you to stand up and bullies typically stand down when the numbers get big enough right so again i i have rust i haven't played it because it's a broken ass piece of crap that doesn't work in any case right but you took my money gary and 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 now you admit that the game is broken uh, and, and perhaps you're admitting that you're just going to basically provide some updates so that you don't have at least the moral right to give me my money back. But I would like my money back uh, if possible. Uh, and, and maybe I'll, I'll put together a Steam refund request and see what happens. So I guess, you know, the conclusion here is, you know, look, we, we should always be respectful of other people. We should always be uh, polite but firm. Uh, when we are dealing with with a difference of uh, of expectation between what was promised and what we have uh, but but we shouldn't cower behind threats of developers doing us a favor and that we should basically accept their crap okay we should be firm we should be defend we should be demanding and we should support each other when we are being respectful and demanding rather than attacking each other Right? If somebody is being firm but demanding and asking for what they paid for, we should not admonish that person you know, on the fear that the developer might no longer support our platform. We should demand that we get what we pay for and let that developer know that we will pay for more of their games if they make us good with what they are delivering. And if they don't, we won't buy their games on any platform. Uh, I would, as usual, you know, kind of, uh, if you have comments, thoughts, posts, uh, you know, we've got our subreddit, uh, r forward slash mostly underscore Linux, or you can send us an email at mostly Linux at protonmail.com. We'll be back in 10 seconds here with some final thoughts. Thanks for sticking with us here on our final thoughts. I haven't done the editing yet, obviously, because I'm still recording the uh, podcast. So I'm not sure the length, but like I said, in editing, I'll try to keep it down to an hour. I've been trying to move things along a little quicker this time. Um, appreciate any feedback from anybody. I did get some feedback on Reddit last week, uh, and thank you very much for providing that feedback. Uh, we take all constructive criticism to heart, uh, just like we, uh, you know, advise our uh, developer community to do so when we complain about their their games. Um, we're all over the place on the web. Uh, you can follow us on mostly underscore Linux on Twitter. We've got our subreddit mostly underscore Linux. We've got our Steam Gamer group uh, mostly Linux. We've got our Twitch channel, uh, mostly Linux. We've got our YouTube channel, mostly Linux, and we've got a proton. No, sorry. We've got a proton email, mostly Linux at protonmail.com. And we've got a peer tube channel, mostly Linux. So searching mostly Linux should get you access to our content, including through our podcast on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and everything else out there. Uh, if you are, you know, a, a regular viewer, watcher, listener, please uh, give us like a positive thumbs up wherever you are at. And let's get the word out. Um, in any case, that's episode 0 0.18. It's a wrap. And we will be back next week with episode 0 0.19 here on at Mostly Linux on Mostly Gaming. See you next week.